Okay, I think uh, we, we, we should uh, probably start. So uh, we are very happy to have Alok Alada from Chennai Mathematical Institute. And uh, uh, today in the afternoon, we have uh, two sessions, both uh, dedicated to gravitational radiation, BMS symmetry, so theorems, memory, and, and, and all that. And so the first session will be by Alok, and then the second one by Monica. I guess as, as, uh, as it, uh, we do it these days, uh, I, we, we will have a short break after one hour, maybe for a few minutes. And then uh, okay. we will have uh, another half an hour and then some time for questions. Okay, uh, please, Alok, take it away. Thank you, Sasha. Th thanks a lot to all the organizers for inviting me and also to all the participants for coming on Friday evening for this uh, lecture. So I haven't put the entire title here in the in the slide, but basically the main idea is to talk about uh, soft gravitational radiation, asymptotic symmetries, and uh, uh, conservation laws. Uh, so yeah, so let me just start. Uh, we, I, I'm going to really do kind of a real time lecture, but for the introduction, I've already written some things down. So this is something I kind of shamelessly took from Justin's uh, lecture that where he, you know, we saw that he kind of outlined three sort of the most common approximation schemes for computing radiation in, um, in, uh, in spiral problem or also in scattering. So the, there is of course the post-Newtonian uh, scheme that as he explained is uh, where you do, your background is basically, you know, the infinite T going to infinity limit and the perturbation parameter is uh, V over C. And then the, for the scattering problem, there is the post-Minkowskian uh, approximation where you know, you're really perturbing around uh, no gravity limit and the perturbation parameter is the Newton's constant. And then there was the self-force approximation, which is basically also sometimes called the probe scatter approximation, where one particle is much heavier than the other and we can treat it as a probe in the Schwarzschild geometry of the heavier particle. Um, and of course, the kind of the ultimate object that you want to compute is the uh, radiation at any frequency. So I just, uh, in four dimensions, I have just drawn here the sort of sketch of what Justin basically drew also that we can have a, you know, uh, in spiral leading to a merger and uh, we would like to compute the radiation gravitational field which decays as one over R uh, with a distance at any frequency omega. So what uh, I want to basically convince you in this uh, lecture, hopefully is that there is another uh, approximation which is kind of complementary to the ones that Justin explained in which we really expand around the, what we call the soft limit, which is the zero frequency limit. And uh, uh, of course we will, we will look at this in more detail, but uh, there are like some aspects of this which are quite interesting. Uh, yeah, as hopefully it will become clear that this, um, this approximation or this expansion, soft expansion is uh, sort of non-perturbative in the sense that the result we obtain are exact in V over C and G. So we don't really need to go to V gravity limit uh, uh, to compute the soft, uh, soft radiation. And these results are probably the most interesting reason these results are interesting, even though they're at uh, small frequencies is because they're, uh, is there a question? Okay, uh, because they are universal. So as you, as you will see, I, hopefully I'll be able to convince you that, uh, that these, these results, which you, you know, you compute radiation at some, uh, some orders in frequency, soft fre uh, low frequency, <laughs> they're, really independent of the details of the scattering. And then finally, there are some interesting connections with uh, you know, symmetries of classical and quantum gravity and scattering amplitudes. And this idea, this, this especially this point three, these interconnections between classical and quantum and you know, amplitudes and symmetries was sort of formalized by Pasteurski and Strominger in a nice object, which they call infrared triangle. And uh, in fact, there are, as we will see, there, there, are, there are many infrared triangles, not one, and probably we, we will discover more as we go along. Uh, but this is the basic idea of the infrared triangle. So you have three, um, you know, three structures in your theory. Uh, you have um, classical soft radiation, which, uh, which, uh, sorry, which uh, 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 follows some universal properties. Uh, and uh, it is related, very directly related to infinitely many conservation laws, which are associated to some symmetries as you will see, uh, which are uh, called, uh, you know, which are, which are called Bondi, Meissner, Sachs, or their extensions, uh, symmetries. Um, and in fact, it turns out that, you know, so this is the classical side of the story. And 
if you quantize this symmetry and look at the word identity for the s matrix then they have a direct connection with with what is what are known as quantum soft theorems which are perhaps more known than the what what uh, the universal aspects of the classical soft radiation so uh, so this is the formal object object that you would like to at least have some 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 understanding of in these lectures and what i am going to do in this lecture is going to focus purely on the classical side so sort of uh, try to uh, discuss the connection between this classical radiation theory and uh, asymptotic symmetries uh, and what monica will do in lecture 2 will focus on the quantum side which is the you know relationship between the word identities for the quantum gravity s matrix and the amplitude uh, soft theorems for the amplitudes and actually there is a interesting the third side is interesting and in many ways open even now and hopefully in the discussion we can take the, the you know how, how do we take classical limit from the quantum amplitude so so this is the basic structure and uh, this is the sort of a rough um, outline of my talk i do not know how much i will be able to cover uh, uh, we, we because we are going to deal with radiation the nicest place to study radiation is uh, infinity so we have to have some formal you know structure of infinity that we will study first and then we will see that there are uh, infinite dimensional symmetries in classical gravity which perhaps most of you are uh, familiar with but you know just we briefly review the known as bms symmetries and uh, then uh, i will try to convince you that there are certain universal result if we study radiation uh, gravity uh, in uh, we study soft radiation in gravity theory in d greater than or equal to four dimensions and uh, actually there are some subtleties in four dimensions which uh, give rise to interesting observables which are called tail to the memory and that if i have time i will uh, i will look at so uh, okay so maybe i just start from here but please feel free to uh, stop me at any time questions also is it is it uh, are you able to hear properly yes yes we can we can okay. hear yes. okay so uh, so yeah so the, so the one kind of central object in this game are the infinities of space time and i mean so just to start with a, like something very basic so we know that if we take some minkowski metric uh, and we write it in uh, uh, you know uh, uh, retarded coordinate u and uh, the spherical coordinates r theta and phi then uh, you know we can uh, basically at a fixed u we can go to large distances uh, as r goes to infinity uh, keeping u fixed uh, and we we um, you know we we hit this boundary of space time which is usually called future null infinity uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, you know it's it's a cylinder topologically so it's s1 cross r and interestingly enough i mean if you if just uh, you know if you, if you just uh, like track the what the metric goes to in this and this boundary then the metric turns out to be uh, so you know let's write it uh, you mean it's turns, two cos r uh, as two I, i apologize yeah sorry thank you as two cos r and uh, the metric kind of degenerates into a, a, a metric which is a degenerate metric actually uh, which is just qab so that's that's the that's that's why it's called null infinity it's a, it's really a null three dimensional uh, space and uh, just just for um, just for later uh, uh, notation i'm go always going to use these axes are basically coordinates on the sphere at infinity and i'm going to always use stereographic coordinates so i'll use you know the usual z and uh, z bar which is uh, in tan theta by 2 to the i phi that's uh, this because they will be convenient for us when we when we study symmetry so of course similarly we can if you work with advanced coordinates then we get a, a different boundary not really connected to the future null infinity which is called scry minus like the same structure and that is obtained if you know if you keep r fixed and you track back to uh, constant v uh, coordinate where v is of course uh, so but okay so this is uh, of course uh, uh, um, i think that most people are familiar with uh, that then uh, but since we are studying scattering of course you you may wonder that you know this is not enough because only massless fields and particles leak out to null infinities we what we really need is also where the massive particles end up and that structure is really more interesting um, so i just draw the when i draw it like this what i mean is that there is a like i'm just like blowing up the sphere here this uh, and and it's so so this whole this is just this whole thing is just 
future null infinity and this is past null infinity and now if you want to study this uh, sort of the end point of this uh, uh, future null infinity for example then the most convenient way to study this is to blow it up so so this is usually you know denoted as i plus and this one is i minus and for scattering uh, the the most convenient way to study i plus is the following so i just draw it again here so what what you do is you uh, you know you work with since you are only interested in where uh, massive geodesics or massive particles end up you you are not interested in going outside the light cones you know you just basically look for example you are mostly interested only in this region if you want to study the you know the asymptotics of massive particles and so here in this wedge uh, there is a nice uh, coordinate system that you can use which is uh, which let me just call uh, tau rho and xa xa are the same the coordinates on the sphere where tau is uh, square root t square minus r square and rho is uh, r by tau so rho is like a radial coordinate and you can immediately check that i mean that's that's very easy to see that if you keep r fixed and take t to infinity then you hit uh, and then tau goes to infinity plus infinity so you basically reach you know you basically reach uh, sorry uh, you you reach this point here right here but if you if you um, you know if you keep if you keep tau fixed Uh, and take a row to infinity, then you can check that it's a small algebra, but you can check that you will always end up at u equal to zero. So what it kind of tells you is that you know you are sort of representing your um, uh, uh, infinity, time-like infinity, with uh, hyperboloids like slices like this, which are always intersecting for any tau uh, u equal to zero. And just by you know. coordinate transformation you can check that the metric um, if you write the metric in these coordinates then that is given by minus d tau square plus uh, i mean this is not very much important for us but just to for completeness i write it uh, rho square qa b dx a and where 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 you know where this uh, this metric is actually known uh, i mean it's an interesting metric in its own right it's the metric for uh, euclidean adsp okay any that 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 was just an aside so now so these are the boundaries we are interested in because you know we are interested in scattering so it is all we don't really care about the uh, you know the boundary at uh, uh, fixed time if you go to uh, you know r r take r to infinity um uh, which is which is usually called the the space like infinity or i not but that that's a, that that's the boundary which will not be directly important Uh, so now we uh, sort of expand our domain to go from flat space time to uh, 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 all the solutions of einstein's equation with a no cosmological constant so which which we just call asymptotically flat space time uh, so i i i give you um, uh, i'm sure there are much more precise definitions which are kind of way above my pay grade but i give you a nice simple definition that Uh, is that basically you take any space time so take a metric g and you write it for example in the uh, you know in the ur xa coordinates and you again take r going to infinity limit and you like look at what the metric goes to at say sky plus and if it reduces to the metric we have in the for the minkowski which was this one uh, then we will call it uh, asymptotically flat Uh, space time so then this g is a simple uh, so basically it's uh, all 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 space times which have the same uh, infinity at as uh, same null infinity as minkowski space you mean after a conformal transformation yes yes yeah sorry i'm just uh, I, i was yeah exactly i mean i when i do this as, as you know i mean yeah i'm just kind of Uh, skipping over the conformal uh, compactification details but yeah it's like this um so so this this class of matrices we can actually parameterize nicely so you know we we can basically write any such uh, we can do expansion uh, parameterize them uh, gab uh, close to say for example scry plus or scry minus i mean i i i am doing for scry plus but everything i'm saying I will also analogously for the first time. 
and this this parameterization which was uh, you know which was given by bondi and many many years many decades back i, I think it was 65 uh, 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 so so in order to do this parameterization of course we have to fix a gauge because if you want to write any metric we have to choose a coordinate system and the gauge that uh, with justin was just mentioning uh, which he chose which is for bondi gauge uh, is a gauge in which you you basically take uh, g r r to be zero and uh, g r a to be zero and uh, uh, determinant of the the the, the cycle uh, components of the metric uh, two cross two metric uh, uh, just take um, sorry uh, by uh, r square to be equal to determinant of DOP. So these are the four conditions that he chose. So uh, uh, just, I mean, you know, the, the, this is uh, not as maybe common as the, the Dunder gauge, uh, but perhaps more useful in uh, uh, maybe in uh, uh, nonlinear theory, uh, at least in the in the in the radiation. If you want to study radiation at nonlinear, for example, as you mentioned. Uh, so now, with, in this Bondi gauge, you can write any asymptotically flat metric. As follows. So I'm just going to write it and then uh, explain all the, the, the new terms that I introduced. So get uh, yeah. I, I just write the terms that we need and then I, I just explain. Oops, sorry. Uh, and just two more. Just, uh, I won't, of course, uh, write <laughs> two main terms. Uh, okay, so I just explain. I just wrote terms which are kind of necessary for us. So this V naught is a little bit strange because you would expect this V naught to be one because you know it's a leading uh, uh, leading uh, uh, term in the metric. But this V naught actually just turns out to be equal to uh, the Ricci of the sphere metric. So if you are, if you are, so if you choose your Q to be a unit sphere metric, this Q to be a unit sphere metric, then of course V naught is one. But as we will see that we will allow for deformations of Q uh, when we consider symmetries, very general symmetries of gravity. And so in principle, V naught can be this, just the, you know, just this number, uh, just a function of the sphere. Metric. Um, and then the the bondy, this MB is basically what is called the what is known as a bondi mass aspect uh, which measures the uh, uh, roughly speaking measures the energy that leaks out to infinity at fixed u and fixed angle and pro probably the most important player in the game is uh, this guy cab which is called the shear field as it determines uh, it contains complete information about the radiation so cab is again the shear field Um, uh, uh, it, it, as you will see that it has all the information about the radiation. The UA is just, you know, actually UA is not that important for us, but I had to write it uh, because I wanted to introduce NA, which is more important for us. But anyway, I just write UA. So UA is just, um, just, the, uh, just the divergence of the shear. But whenever I write capital D, it is just the derivative with respect to the sphere metric. That's that's the notation I use, and this NA is what is uh, it, it is like the bondi mass aspect, but uh, it basically measures the angular momentum. Uh, uh, at you know, which is leaking out at fixed U and at a given angle. Okay, so that that's the um, that's the that's what we need. Of course, then there are other terms. I just. So this is the expansion of all asymptotically flat uh, space times in Bondi gauge. Um, yeah. Is there any question? Then I can just stop here. Okay. Then I just proceed. So now, uh, okay. So now once we have this, so we have like basically now what we have done is we have parameterized. Um, 
uh, space of all uh, asymptotically flat geometries. Uh, so we can uh, kind of an obvious question to ask is, you know, what, what, what are the transformation which keep this space, this huge space intact? So you know, what, so we can just phrase it as what is the symmetric group of uh, group uh, of this on this space. Uh, which, which just means that uh, it, it should take, uh, it should, we take any metric which is asymptotically flat and uh, it should map us to a like, physically distinct metric, but which is also asymptotically flat. Um, and we, uh, as, as we will see that this, uh, this symmetry group is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a quite a large group, infinite dimensional group and I guess people still discover more and more enhancement of this group because of the, some developments in the quantum gravity uh, uh, infrastructure of quantum gravity as matrix. But the, 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 the one that we start with is the one that was discovered by Bondi, Marsner and Sachs, who first uh, uh, sort of realized that the actual symmetry group was much larger than the, uh, uh, the Poincare group. I mean, naively, of course, you would expect Poincare because the space time is becoming flat at large distances, but because the radiation is leaking out, the story is a little bit more complicated. And what they realized uh, was that, you know, if you consider all possible, so I just, uh, I just first write down the, so of course, when we, when we say we want to find symmetry group, we want to find the generators of the symmetry group. And that basically means we want to find um, uh, uh, vector fields, which, uh, you know, which, which change the metric uh, we change the physical data at infinity. So we want to find vector fields. Let me just call it zeta a, which uh, which change the shear. At least change the shear. I mean, they could also change the sphere metric, as we will see. But they should at least change the shear. I mean, if they don't change shear, then they are just uh, you know pure gauge transformations. And so this is what Bondi, Matsner, Sachs focused on. They fixed the sphere metric. So they fixed Q to be the unit sphere metric. Just you know. In the stereographic coordinates, uh, and then they uh, showed that you know the uh, symmetric group is given by following vector fields. So uh, the, the there's way, one class. Uh, it's, yes, yes. it's not Matzner, but it is Metzner with an e. Oh, sorry, I apologize. Thank you. Um, and uh, so the, 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 there are two class of vector fields which they sort of found. So one is the, as I will explain, one is the expected one and one was the surprise. So there is a class of vector fields which is parameterized by functions on the sphere, smooth functions on the, on the, on the sphere at infinity. And it's, uh, it's given by, uh, it has obviously components along all directions. So it has, uh, and then there is a term which is, uh, and that's it, it kind of stopped there. Uh, and then there is a, uh, so, so if you look at this uh, class of vector field, we see that um, uh, it can, we can immediately actually deduce that if we take f equal to one, then zeta f just becomes do u. And that is just the time translation. So that's the exact killing field of the, of the slight metric. And so it is, of course, a asymptotic symmetry of also of an asymptotically flat space time because it won't change the metric at infinity. Uh, but uh, we could do more, like if we take y f to be any, uh, you know, uh, if we take, for example, I just slightly, sorry, I switch coordinates. If we take, say, for example, the spherical harmonics, so there are three of them, then uh, zeta f basically uh, gives us three translations, space translations. But everything else is new uh, in the sense none of the other vector fields are killing symmetries of flat space time. So, so, so this was the, uh, the, the new class of symmetries they found. And the other uh, class of vector field was something that you would expect. So it, will, it was just the class which uh, you know, parameterizes the Lorentz symmetries, which uh, let me just write and explain. So this class is parameterized by vector field on the sphere. And I just let's write the expression for it. For it. Uh, I mean, the, 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 not 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 uh, the the of course the details are not very important, but just uh, just write some terms. 
uh, where these Ys are basically, um, you know, if you take if you take SL two C generators. So you just take y to be of uh, you know coming from any of the six uh, y z to be say one z z square i i z i z square and and then you take the you know you take the real uh, uh, part uh, so that basically you take y z do z plus y z bar this is that so these generate uh, all possible so there are six of them and they generate the uh, the Lorentz group. And uh, of course, as you can see that the, the ones involving th these guys, they will generate boost because they will generate non-compact vector fields and the ones which have an I will generate the rotations. By the okay. way, I have a okay. yes. question just to clarify. Yes. You said you were talking about symmetries that transform physically the metric, but here you are talking about diffeomorphisms. Yeah, yes, yes. So I, I was just and view them that. as yes. passive, just, I mean, nothing changes physically so far. Uh, yes, yes. So I was just coming to that. So the reason these are these are diffeomorphisms, but the reason these are symmetries, I mean, one way to see it is because they change the uh, change, they, they change the physical data, they change the shear. So, so if I just, uh, just, uh, I, I, yeah, let, let me just explain. So yeah, that, that was the next thing I wanted to discuss. So why are these symmetries? Uh, uh, because of the fact that you, so you, you, you can take, for example, so let's take super translation. So consider beta f for any f. Um, and and we can we can track what uh, how uh, how the the shear field changes under beta f. Uh, basically, by um, you know we just compute the lead derivative of the metric, uh, the the sphere components of the metric, and then we like look at the how the linear in R term changes, how the, and that basically will give you this uh, guy and that guy turns out to be equal to, um, so it's not, it's, it's not, it's not zero and it's, uh, So that that's the that's the that's the uh, so that's why these are although they are diffeomorphisms they are what we would call large diffeomorphisms because they don't die down at infinity and uh, and that's why they are symmetric because they change the physical data for the, yeah but for our you can also say that you just slice differently infinity with the same physical gravitational wave data you just look at it in a different slice it's still uh, uh, okay, so so yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So so another another maybe yeah, I, I will yeah say a little bit more about this. So of course maybe one one another way to classify differential is to compute Noether charges. So if Noether charges are zero, then we would uh, you know they are just gauge. But if they are not, then uh, uh, they are just symmetries. In the sense that of course if I take f equal to one, then it's just the uh, uh, you know then it just com it, it computes the total energy of the of the radiation. So that's the, so that's clearly the symmetry that uh, maybe, maybe, sorry, maybe I misunderstand the, the question. No, I think the, the basic conceptual problem in calling them symmetries, but okay, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so maybe, sorry, yeah, maybe I should say that, uh, so I should be more precise, maybe that, that, uh, that BMS are really usually called asymptotic symmetries as opposed to global symmetries, because, you know, they only act at infinity. So, so certainly there is something to distinguish between them and global symmetries, uh, or sometimes they are also called large gauge transformation because of what you just mentioned. That, uh, you know, they, they are really diffeomorphisms, except that they don't decay at infinity to zero. Uh, okay. So, but now it turns out that uh, so 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 we already did an enhancement from you know translation group subgroup. Uh, so B this BMS already did the uh, enhancement uh, to um, uh, you know to just so to, to to arbitrary f all possible f and this is uh, these are called super translations. So uh, all all f's which are not you know the first 
L equal to zero and L equal to one spherical harmonic, they are extra above over and above translation and they are called super translations. But we haven't really done any announcement for the SL2C, so we still have the SL2C. And here it turns out that you know there are two um, two two uh, announcements which were considered. Um, uh, so the one of an obvious thing we can do because of the motivation which comes from say uh, 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 conformal field theory is to announce this to um, uh, the Virasoro algebra, at least at the level of algebra. So what that means is that you take the, uh, you know, for SL2C, we have the vector fields on the sphere, which are conformally killing and, and globally well-defined. So they satisfy this equation, but they, they, are, they, are, they don't have any poles anywhere. So we just enhance it to, uh, uh, you know, to conformally killing fields, which are uh, meromorphic also, I mean, which can have poles. Uh, so this was an extension which was proposed by Barnich uh, uh, and Troisart. Uh, and uh, it was inspired by a uh, work of uh, Strominger and Kachazo, Freddy Kachazo uh, in 2012. And, and it, it, it's called, uh, I mean, kind of a, a boring name, it's called extended VMS. Symmetry. Uh, but there's another uh, sort of announcement we can do of SL2C. And we will come to see why this announcement, I mean, right now they look very ad hoc, but you will see why they are, uh, uh, they are actually physical announcements. And that uh, is also based on a work that uh, Sasha Zibodov, Spastesky and Strominger did, as you see. So there's another announcement where you basically take these vector fields, which are, uh, you know, globally well-defined, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they are uh, conformally killing to all possible smooth diffeomorphisms on the sphere. So, uh, you know, so you, you, you allow, you allow, you take this vector field Y and you just allow, just expect it, just demand that it be smooth. It don't have pole anywhere, but it's not holomorphic or anything like that. Now this vector field, this announcement uh, is, looks a little bit strange in the sense that it, uh, you know, the, it, it, it deforms the sphere matrix. So let me explain what, what I mean. So if we, if we track back, so if we track what this, uh, you know, what the sphere vector field do to uh, the metric Q. So we, again, to compute this is to be compute the lead derivative of the space-time metric, and we drag the R square component. Basically. So that, that's just some algebra. And then, so we, we do that, and this turns out to be equal to LYQAB minus R. So you know if y is just not conformally killing or anything, then this is not zero. It, it just so it, so it deforms the, but it deforms it smoothly. It deforms the matrix smoothly. So, uh, but it can be checked that this doesn't mean that I mean the space time is still asymptotically flat. So we will still get the you know because of our criteria that you know that the metric at um, infinity projects onto this metric that is still satisfied. I think I wrote it up uh, about uh, ah, this one. So this will still be satisfied, but Q will be Q will be deformed now to some uh, you know some some metric which is not uh, unit sphere metric. But uh, uh, there are more sophisticated way to say why this is asymptotically flat by you know computing the wild tensor, and one can check that this doesn't destroy the asymptotic factors. But in any case, so that's the enhancement that is possible. Uh, so we have two possible, you know, symmetry groups on the space of solutions. So this is right now not a symmetry of scattering or anything like that. So we just say that we have this on the space of uh, asymptotically flat solutions. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have this large symmetry, uh, either super translation with, uh, you know, with Virasoro or super translation with um, uh, and, and these both, of course, contain uh, point carry symmetries. But 
but this is not very interesting for scattering because this is just a math thing like you know in space of solutions we are asking what are the transformation which change the solution but okay but you know and and what we did here is completely focus on scry plus and because scry plus and scry minus are really two disjoint boundaries so we could have done the same thing on scry minus so really what we get so so let, let me just call this both these i mean just just let let me just call them let 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 me just call them bms extended uh, even though i mean they are, they are different groups but we will just for the sake of this argument so what we have is a bms extended at scry plus what we just uh, kind of uh, discuss right now but you know we could have a completely independent bms uh, at scry minus in other words i could i could take a vector field here which is parameterized by some function f plus and some vector field y plus and here uh, you know uh, parameterized by f minus and uh, y minus of course when when i do this uh, transformation on space of solutions i don't consider both i just take one and i transform my space time but there is still a question of you know when if you want to study scattering then what is the symmetric group that we can deduce out of these kind of abstract groups and so here was a a uh, 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 key observation by andrew strominger many years back 2013 where he showed that there is a nice way to at least propose a symmetry for the s matrix so so here is the setup we have so we we have some massive say particles which come uh, it's just classical scattering and and finally you could have a strong gravity region etc and then some radiation is emitted um and then okay we would like to find out if this uh, you know extended bms or bms is a symmetry for the scattering process so the 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 most intuitive thing we could try to propose is the following that if we did not have any strong gravity region and if i gave you some um if i gave you a function on so sorry let me just draw some spheres here so suppose i have empty space and i give you some function here say f minus and i want to find out what the value the function takes at you know scry plus then if i just you know look at the light ray which shoots here and goes then it will always hit the antipodal point so the function here uh, it will evaluate to the same function but at the antipodal point if, if this was a function which was uh, this if this point was like say so it is uh, uh uh you know this, this is a just a initial argument but this initial argument can at least motivate a proposal that we should consider the bms extended which is really parameterized by only one function of course and one uh, sphere vector field with the antipodal identification but this is the, right now there is no reason to believe this is a symmetry because you know in the strong gravity region these things obviously are not uh clear why this would continue to hold so one thing i would try to convince you is that at least in uh, it, it is a symmetry in the, in a certain sense in antipodal i think so i have can i ask you about uh, this on, on top of this on top of the yes. slide so so you define uh, you define the asymptotic symmetry group as a factor of, so you have some phase space at null infinity and then you have allowed diffeomorphism and a factor over trivial ones right Yes. Yes. This is uh, now. Uh, what mathematically picks one versus the other? You you, you wrote two two possibilities, and so. Uh, yes. Yes. So, so you you mean the you mean these extensions? These ones? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So uh, so I mean uh, so uh, I mean naively I would say that um, the Virasoro symmetries uh, look a little bit singular from classical GR perspective because of course as you have shown in one of your papers also that. they basically you know produce something like cosmic strings when yeah. uh, uh, in the space time so in that sense if i i, I demand that i want to only look at space of okay. smooth classical solutions then this one looks like a more uh, okay uh, uh, yeah but 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 there is also other other uh, some other reasons that maybe we can come to uh, okay but i agree that from quantum perspective it's not really clear which one i mean per, per, perhaps from that perspective virasoro looks more promising <laughs> uh, Yeah. By the way, I ah. would like also. Yes. 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 This is Thibaut Damour speaking. Make yes. a remark. Uh, actually, here you are assuming something physically now in presence of 
scattering massive particles that uh, that um, the space-time is asymptotically flat in the naive Bondi power law sense, but actually mm, there yeah. are arguments I, showing it is not true. Okay. Yes, I know. I know. I will. I will. I will. I will come to that. So, so yeah, I apologize. This is a sketchy argument, and we will hopefully discuss that point in some detail. And of course, okay. it goes back to your paper with uh, Luke on the uh, hereditary uh, terms, but. No, no, yeah, I, I just wanted to another motivate paper it. by me where one I've shown that the sky is not even C zero. Uh, yes, yes, I know. I, I yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. But the the you mean there are logar logar um, uh, terms in the metric perturbation? Is that the no? Before uh, even law, they are worse than that. Yes, there, there was the it's a physical, it's a mathematical question whether this formalism mm -hmm. makes sense when you have yes. scattering. Yes. Really. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so I. I yeah, uh, yeah. So let, let, maybe I hopefully I try to convince you at least that the super translations are certainly um, uh, uh, symmetries of classical scattering. But if you just uh, yeah, that that would be one thing I would like to cover. And about the other extension, uh, at least I like to try to convince you that at one p.m. order. But I guess that's not a big deal. They they are certainly symmetries. But that there, there are issues at higher p.m. that also I will just mention, which are related to the tails to the memory. So I, I, I'm not sure if they will answer completely your question, but there are certainly subtleties that hopefully we will discuss. Yeah. So at this point, it is a proposal, but we try to see how much we can uh, make sense of it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was just yeah. So now now just to also this is also related to Thibu's question that look you know how how do we know their symmetry? So at least or at least asymptotic symmetry. So one kind of uh, thing to maybe do is to compute charges. Um, like the charges. Uh, and then if they are zero, then of course there is no argument and you don't really have any, they are just pure gauge transformation. But you know, in general, I mean, and this is one nice thing that happened because of null infinity that we can compute these things in full nonlinear GR. So, so one, one, one aside, like a small claim that we can maybe make is that uh, 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 a nice, uh, nice analysis that was done in eighties was that uh, you know uh, uh, at scry plus uh, we have a phase space for uh, uh, for a full uh, 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 nonlinear GR. Which is, uh, n n I mean, in the canonical formulation, it will be very hard because of constraints, etc. But it's try things kind of simplify, and so I just I just tell you what the phase space is. So the idea is that we have this uh, uh, CAB, which is a function of uh, you know the retarded coordinate and the sphere. Again, I'm doing everything at scry plus, but just the same thing at uh, we can do at scry minus. And now the uh, uh, CAB, so th there was something here assumed, which may be also related to Thibaut's question in 80s that at what is the asymptotic of the CAB at large U? And so as U goes to infinity, uh, uh, if, you, if you assume that, you know, the boundary conditions on the shear are that it goes to uh, some, some um, sorry, maybe I change the notation. Uh, I take uh, U going to uh, plus or minus infinity as, uh, like a constant mode, which depends on the sphere, plus some uh, decay, which, which can be small, quite arbitrarily small, but uh, it has to decay. Uh, and this was the acid condition which was put by, I think it was uh, Ashtick, Ashticker and Strubel. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if there were some some other people before, but certainly this the this was discussed in this uh, work by them in 1981. I think. And so, if you assume that this is the asymptotic for a shear condition for the shear, then uh, you can immediately deduce nicely that there is a nice bracket, for example, between the oh, oh sorry, I should have, I should have, I should have so if you, if you introduce a quantity which like just which is known as a new tensor, which is like the you know the field field strength in the electromagnetic. So C is analogous to the vector potential, and uh, this is analogous to the field strength. And um, this this news uh, on this uh, uh, on this news, we can define nice uh, uh, bracket structure, which is, which, which is true in full theory. I mean, we don't we are not linearizing, um, which is just uh, uh, so I I put eight pi g. Sorry, I put eight pi g to be one. 
and so then we get just um, So that, that's, the, that's the bracket and using this bracket, one can actually, now we can ask, okay, what are the charges for super translation in the sense that, you know, if I want to compute QF acting on uh, NAB, so that it reproduces for me partial U delta FCAB, then what expression I should uh, have. And it turns out that this QF we can uh, determine and uh, it's it's easy to write down actually in this case, which, which is, um, so, so here I'm just looking at pure gravity and you know, I don't have anything else. And then uh, it just uh, has a nice form, which is. So this is like, this is uh, really the, I mean, I guess this, this can be thought of as the stress tensor for gravity, which leaks out at null infinity. And, but then this, so this term itself is not very surprising, but then there is the, uh, oops, there's an F. And th there's an extra term, which is and this term is of course a bit surprising because it's not, you know, it's linear in the news. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't have a definite sign or anything. So it can have computing effect with reg regard to this term, which is always positive. And uh, so, uh, so, 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 so this is, so this is non-trivial and uh, it's um, yeah. It, it it is the charge that you just compute at scry plus for the super translation uh, symmetry. But now something very interesting happened that if you look at Einstein's equations, if you look at equations of motion uh, at scry you know, at scry plus. So because you expand the metric in one by r, you can also expand Einstein's equation in one by r. And there was this just recall that there was a component which was which we call the Bondi mass aspect. Um, then it turns out that the uh, equation motion of this bondi mass aspect uh, is equal to um, uh, and then uh, minus if in case you have some massless matters will i just include it for completeness then it would also have this term so, uh, uh, so you notice that this, this. Uh, so, if you don't have matter field, so if this is zero, then this, um, uh, this is exactly what is uh, uh, coming in this formula here, and so we can write QF as um, integral over scry plus F. Uh, F is only a function of x a. It's only a function of sphere, and uh, do you? Um, which uh, it gives us um, uh, oh, minus. So that gives us MBU equal to minus infinity. Uh, this is just giving, going to give us uh, F MBU equal to minus infinity integrated over the sphere minus F MBU equal to plus infinity. So, so that's uh, the that's the nice formula that uh, we have for the super translation. And so now, if we um, uh, and we can actually do a little bit more. So we can say that okay, suppose the radiation uh, decays uh, at some rate so that the system relaxes to vacuum. So if the if if uh, um, at u equal to plus infinity, uh, uh, mb leaks to suppose it decays to zero. And this, this can happen if, I mean, intuitively this can happen if you don't have any massive particles in the field. So if you only have massless fields and you know, fi finite energy, then you know, they, they won't leak out at u equal to plus infinity. And then you would expect the total mass of space time to go to zero. Of course, this will clearly break down if you have massive particles, which are going to, uh, in a time like infinity. And we, we will come back to that point. So, but if you just for a moment assume this is zero, then you can see that the super translation charge is just minus integral f. Uh, and we are equal to minus um, So now uh, we can uh, Strominger's proposal, which uh, which uh, about the conservation law in classical theory, precisely was that 
we have one um, at cry plus we have a super translation function which let us just call it f plus and at cry minus we have the um, antipodally identified super translation function f minus so f plus at xa is um, f minus f minus xa and so then uh, uh, the we can we can propose the following conservation law which is that you know uh, so sorry that uh, integral f um, xa f plus xa uh, mb u equal to minus infinity is equal to integral f minus uh, minus xa mb b equal to plus infinity so this is a proposal that uh, uh, this this is a proposal that uh, uh, strominger gave uh, and uh, uh, this was uh, the sort of as we will see in the in lecture 2 by monica that this really was inspired by uh, uh, some some soft constraints in scattering amplitude but what we want to see in this lecture is the validity of this proposal in classical theory so that, that's what we are uh, we try to um, understand uh, let, let me just like quickly say that we could do the same thing with uh, diff s2 or the uh, so i i just uh, just because of lack of time i don't go into too much detail but just say say that so if you now look at the other class of vector fields so consider uh, either diff s2 or actually for this purpose we could also because we are in classical theory i can kind of just prefer to look at diff s2 but uh, for the sake of this argument perhaps we could also look at birasoro then the same ideas basically lead to a conservation law proposal again uh, may i ask a question from, may i ask a question uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, i mean in the previous equation yes 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 uh, can you take out the f's and say that the integrand agree because i think i heard and yes yes i was i, I was, yes i was about to say that way. yes yeah thank you for that yeah so basically because this is true for all functions yeah i i was i was i was going to just say it after this but because these two for all functions what this implies are really infinity of conservation laws which are telling us that the mass aspect at u equal to minus infinity at any point on the sphere is equal to the mass aspect at the equal okay. to this always surprised me a lot but uh, I, is I, it I, I, yeah so i will try to at least convince you that in classical theory uh, we can prove this uh, at least this I mean, classical yeah, we, i'm talking classical yeah. Yeah, yeah. Classically, uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I hope to at least in the remaining half an hour try to prove that this. Okay. Yeah. But is there not a, a stronger, I mean, usual assumption that the the past limit of the bounded mass is equal to the ADM mass, and under stronger asymptotic condition, this is angle independent. Yeah. So this is not. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, of course, you are right that it would be a kind of a trivial statement, but. Here the non-triviality comes because it is not. So we have not made that assumption. So this is not angle independent. So that that's the that's the key point I think that we would like to. So here only thing I have uh, sorry I I was a little quick. I mean here as I said that the system relaxes to vacuum in the far future. But of course I I also had in mind that we start also in the far past from vacuum. So the mass aspect is zero at uh, u equal to plus infinity and also at v equal to minus infinity. But that's the only uh, that's the only input. Uh, we make and this input we will have to relax if we have massive particles. In which case, also the conservation law that we wrote before, which, which was the you know the one that was this guy, this equal to the similar quantity in the past, that actually works uh, uh, with the massive particles. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But let, let, yeah, let, let me try to. So the proof we will give is more general, which will really pertain to this. Conservation law for this this quantity where we have massive particles and massless fields leaking out into infinity. But just for simplicity, I was focusing on the, yeah, the massless particles here. And let me just say that there was a there's a proposal uh, which is much far more subtle in my opinion. Uh, but also there's a lot of work now done on this proposal, which which is about the conservation law for the other class of symmetry. So there the idea is that so I just write the proposal now because of lack of time that. If you consider the news aspect, sorry. Um, so you take the sphere vector field. Let's just call it one by one. Oops. 
this for x hat as the point in sphere and the news aspect which was you know the one of the components in the metric we wrote down at u equal to minus uh, sorry i apologize angular momentum aspect which we wrote down at uh, uh, in the expansion this is equal to uh, y so this is y a plus again and the antipodally identified uh, vector field uh, So this is a proposal, and this proposal is uh, more subtle in four dimension, but hopefully I, I shall be able to make some comments on this proposal also, um, in, in, uh, if, if I have time. So these are the conservation. So we have really, and again, as Gabriel mentioned, that this also basically implies that uh, this, the essence of this proposal is that the angular momentum aspect um, is, uh, is conserved at all, um, all angles. Uh, I, I should just say a small caveat here that the angular momentum aspect, there's a lot of ambiguity in this definition. Uh, but if we demand this conservation law, then it looks like there's one definition which was actually proposed by uh, Sasha and uh, uh, by um, Pastersky, Strominger, and, uh, and that is the one that seems to lead to this right conservation law. In, in 2015, I think. And uh, recently, there has been a lot of work in understanding this, uh, I think, in, in, in the context of what is called spin memory. I don't think I will have time to get into it, by, uh, especially by what I just mentioned here, by Flanagan, uh, Nichols, uh, and also uh, uh, there was a recent uh, paper uh, by Tukolsky at all. So, 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 the, so I think in the so that there there there, there, are, there is um, so so this idea that this leads to gravitational observable, which are called the spin memories, was discovered in this paper, and I think there has been a lot of follow up in, in, the, in the numerical relativity literature now in computing this uh, observable. But now let me just uh, okay, so maybe we take uh, if yeah, I, maybe I it's a maybe it's a good uh, good good point uh, to take uh, to take a three minute break. Okay. So we can get. Uh, so let's get, I guess it's now uh, 58, so let's uh, resume in three minutes. Okay. Okay. And uh, yes, uh, I guess if, so those who want to discuss, welcome. Yes, yes. Sasha, can I just go and get some coffee? I think Sasha just went, but I'm sure you can. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs>
Maybe while we're still waiting for a minute. Alok, so okay. imagine, imagine, imagine we, I would like to construct a space time that violates this, this conditions, this antipodal matching, but let's yes. say we allow for some uh, exotic and pathological matter or anything. Mm -hmm. Are there examples where you can, uh, where you can uh, get a space time where, you know, I compute the bonding mass and I take the limit and I find that it uh, doesn't match. There was a paper by Steve Giddings, I think, who was looking I at some. Um, yeah, for the, for the mass aspect, uh, I would be a bit surprised because the, I think that the, I think we can, unless I'm mistaken, I think we can generically show that the mass aspect, you know, is um, um, uh, conserved in the sense that this is essentially because of the universality of classical memory. So I think that, as, as you know, that that one just follows from the conservation law, uh, the displacement memory, the, the usual memory. So I think that somehow I, I feel that the mass aspect conservation law is, although it may be very difficult to prove in the full theory, like so far the, so, 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 since you asked me, I just say a small thing that like, if we want to rigorously prove this conservation law, then we really have to zoom in at the spatial infinity because you know, we yes. really have this, yes, yes. So, so here we have the, the sphere uh, at V photo plus infinity and uh, and then we have the, the then the sphere here. And then if we really want to prove this, then we really have to zoom into the spatial infinity, which is a, uh, we, if we blow it up, it becomes a Lorentzian visitor. Um, and then we have to really like study basically Einstein's equation at this visitor and see if this evolves and what it gives us. And in perturbative gravity, it has been shown that it produces the matching. But uh, and I think there was a paper by uh, I think Kartik Prabhu who make a lot of progress, perhaps even in mm -hmm. the nonlinear theory. But I'm not. Yeah, I'm not very sure. Okay. Yeah. But but I think that the thing is that I think there is not much uh, which has been done beyond the you know uh, linear S gravity for the angular momentum. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess we can uh, we can continue. So, okay, okay. Um, so maybe now I just uh, at least try to convince uh, you that that the conservation law that uh, uh, Strominger proposed, uh, you know, they have a nice validity in the classical theory, and uh, so this 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 uh, results are what are called classical soft theorems. They are very analogous to uh, the the soft constraints on quantum amplitudes. So I, I'm first going to just say the, the result and then we try to at least uh, sketch the proof in whatever remaining time we have. So the idea is the following. So let me again go the, do the setup. So we have a scattering problem, uh, but we don't assume anything about the, the uh, uh, you know, about the nature of the scattering. So it can have a strong gravity region, including it can be a merger and, you know, all, all kinds of objects can be there. And, um, you know, they can decay or, uh, you know, many objects and, also emit some finite energy, for example, gravitational radiation, which I denote here with a green line. So this this is, uh, but our our interest in is in computing um, the uh, soft radiation. So so this is our setup. So we have um, we have some particles coming in. Sorry, I, I I keep drawing two, but I have in mind many. So we have many. But, but many objects coming in with momenta p1 to pn. Uh, I mean, e, e, sorry, incoming momenta. And some p, uh, p1 prime to pn prime. It's outgoing. And, and we can have some uh, fields which are also looking out like this, the one here. And then we want to compute, um, you know, we want to compute are you, the- uh, Are you imposing that there is no incoming radiation, much less? Yes, yes, just for simplicity, sorry. Yes, I, I agree, I should have said that. So no, no incoming, but that we can include it. I just impose that, uh, yes, and no incoming, yes. Coming radiation. And then we want to compute. Um, you know, we want to compute the. Uh, if 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 I write my matrix, of course, this can be a strong gravity region. So there is no reason to believe that the matrix is perturbative around flat space. But uh, uh, suppose I say that I just you know artificially decompose my matrix uh, in space time as eta AB plus HAB. So this H is not small in any sense. 
but of course what i am interested in is to look at the radiative field right so we i am interested in the, you know, the so hab is a function of er in x a so I, i first do the fourier transform i mean the, the time fourier transform and just write as um, so this uh, this this is what we will be interested in because we want to do frequency expansion but of course this is not a like a weak metric or anything like that but now we obviously we are interested in radiation so we take the large r limit so the expansion of hab as a function of uh, large r uh, will go as I, i just write it sketchily so uh, in fact even in uh, any dimension we could just write it as r to the you know um, so I, i just call it radiative because that's the reason component uh, plus the uh, coulombic modes that uh, just just uh, say for example d by 2 i mean whichever is the next uh, term that we have in d dimension uh, so now this is what we want to compute um, this guy and the statement of classical soft theorem which hopefully i will try to convince you is is the following that if i if i look at this hab tilde r omega xa then uh and i do expansion in omega then i get um uh, the following expansion i get hab by omega just let me i i, I just put minus one here uh, xa plus um uh it's plus uh now i'm going to put this in red and i'm going to explain there's a caveat here uh which is omega to the zero plus order omega square terms now this this result is uh exact this these two terms are exact and universal in the sense they don't depend on the details of the scattering in d greater than four dimensions Uh, but in and but in d equal to four dimensions uh as uh because of the you know the long range coulombic effects uh there is a slight subtlety here which uh, still needs to be investigated and this result is true only at so h this so this result is modified as follows so we get this the first term remains intact uh, that that doesn't change but then we get a term which goes as uh, log omega and then uh, we get a term which uh, goes as omega to the zero but the because we have a intermediate term which is going as log omega the nature of this term in the full non linear theory is now no longer clear so this uh this term is uh um uh, you know if at at 1 pm order this is universal this is uh, this is independent of the details of the scattering so this this is um uh, so maybe we could say this is exact in say uh, v by c expansion but if we go to 2 pm etc it is not entirely clear at least in the classical derivation i will give what status of this term is um So, so that that's uh, uh, and this uh, just, just to just to little bit look ahead this universality of this term so if i look at this statement if i focus on this first term which i can re-express in the way that you know limit omega going to zero omega h tilde a b r omega x a then only the first term survive and i get h minus one a b x a uh, 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 this um, so this result um is uh uh equivalent to the mass aspect conservation law that we uh, that stominger had proposed oh, sorry oh sorry my and the h0 ab the 1 pm result of h0 ab which basically tells you that if you do the following projection of on frequency domain 
uh, let me switch to this. Uh, then you just recover only that term remains. And this is equivalent to the angular momentum aspect conservation. But it's a little bit of mystery that, you know, if this is a memory, then uh, as people are now investigating, then it should be an exact result, but there is no proof right now in the classical state for if you go beyond uh, beyond the 1 p.m. expansion. So, so these are the results that hopefully, at least I will try to sketch now. So this is our setup, uh, 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 this one, and now we want to understand how to, uh, uh, you know, how to prove these results. So, um, we just maybe I just wait for one second, one minute if there's a question. So I, I will now just sketch the proof for the classical software. Sorry, okay. na na naive question. Yeah. So uh, when you, you, you wrote this dif uh, differential operator, is it supposed to project out the log term? Uh, uh, just project out, project in the, the omega to the zero term. Yes, yeah, so why why does, uh, sorry, why does log omega in HR does not contribute in this? Oh, 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 I, oh, oh, no, no, no. What I meant is, sorry, thank you, thank you. Yeah, what I meant is that, um, you know, I, I if I want to project in the log term, they have to do uh, okay. If I look at if I do, uh, then this will project uh, precisely the uh, you know the uh, the log term. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so now the 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 what what I um, what I'm saying is that suppose we once we know the log term, so we kind of you know, if we subtract it out from our expansion, so we only look at, you know, at 1 p.m. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, at 1 p.m., maybe this is a better way to say it. I was a bit quick about this. So at 1 p.m., we do not have the lock term. So then okay. this projection, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a 1 p.m. result. So, you know, we don't have the, uh, there's no uh, problem. Okay, uh, thanks. Because the lock term will be absent as we, uh, hopefully I'll be able to argue that absent at 1 p.m. Uh, yeah. But I, 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 yeah, I just want to emphasize that this, this, there is a puzzle here that that is this is this conservation law really to um, you know beyond one pm or not, uh, as seems to be indicated by the recent memory uh, investigations. But I think this needs to be looked at. Uh, okay, so let me now sketch the proof. Uh, so the proof is actually the idea is very simple, and it comes. There are two inspirations behind this proof. One is the Weinberg's book, uh, classic book, you know, of Weinberg. Uh, and one is uh, Justin's paper on curved black hole. Uh, on the on the curved black hole stress tensor. Uh, and this proof uh, we did with Ashok in uh, uh, in uh, 2019. Uh, so now, so just the, the basic idea of the proof is actually very simple. So we say that, okay, we start from our setup. And just for simplicity, let me not worry about the, uh, um, uh, you know, just let, let, let me just start from massive particle scattering and let me not even worry about, uh, uh, you know, of course there is finite energy radiation coming out, like there is no escape, but I'm just going to focus on the, uh, on the massive particles just to begin with. And then we will include the finite energy radiation contribution also. So of course, what we want to compute is, you know, so we, we, we start with the kind of an artificial split. And this was Weinberg's uh, nice motivation of how we can write Einstein's equation. So H is not weak or anything because this can be a completely strong gravity region. But what we can do is we can still write uh, Einstein's equations as so we work in, uh, we can uh, uh, write the trace reverse matrix, sorry, this just some things that you guys, or everyone knows. Uh, we just write the, uh, oh, in arbitrary dimension, D minus two. Um, and then we can uh, 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 write the Einstein's equation as 
box TAB equal to TAB uh, of matter plus whatever else was there in the gravity side that we just you know we just put it um, here in the on the right hand side and this rest so the rest is what maybe I just call it TAB maybe a little bit abuse of notation but just call it TAB gravity. Um, and so, so here I'm, I'm working in the, uh, in the, the reason this makes sense for us is because we are interested in the radiation, radiative field, which is at large distance where we know that space time becomes, uh, you know, asymptotically flat. So even though there may be some very strong gravity effects, uh, you know, this expansion itself is convenient thing for us. Uh, us really. um, and uh, so I, I work with the redonder gauge. So just, you know, partial A. I mean, whenever partial is of course with to eta, and so this is the equation I have. So so far, like not, nothing, nothing new. And then I can rewrite, of course, this in terms of so this EAB as a function of uh, you know, uh, as, as as x. I can write as some uh, just using the because this is a flat space uh, wave operator. So I can rewrite this EAB as uh, you know, in terms of the retarded Green's function. With respect to the flat space, I just put eta here, and then uh, let me just call this whole thing TAB. So the, the full thing is TAB. By the way, the uh, harmonic uh, gauge condition in all dimension has a minus one half, not the minus one over d minus two. Oh, sorry, I apologize. Thank you. Yes, you're right. Sorry. Uh, uh, so now, uh, so this is this is what we have, but this is at any x, and of course this is not uh, very useful for us. But what we want to do that we want to do the partial Fourier transform and take the large R limit, uh, and so then you know the, once you do that, uh, so you have to really take the large R limit in the retarded Green's function, which can be done using a shadow point, and what you get in the end is I just write it here. We get one over. Um, 2 pi i omega mod x to the, uh, oops, sorry, d minus 2 by 2, 1 by 2 omega times a nice looking form, uh, which is uh, d x prime. I, I, I explain the notation in, in a minute, k dot x prime. Where k is nothing but uh, k mu is nothing but um, uh, minus omega one x. So it's just the it's just some vector I defined with respect to omega and x. So this is the this is the form of the radiative field at any frequency. So again, it's not that useful because we have to integrate over the full stress tensor about which we really don't have any control. But you know we are interested in the soft expansion, and there we can do a uh, uh, little bit more. And so there, the uh, so so let me just sketch the proof in pictures. Uh, uh, Sasha, I have uh, ten minutes. Or? Yes, exactly. You have ten ten more minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, so so this is the scattering center, and okay, we have some particles coming in, and scattering, and some finite energy radiation, and some soft. And now what what we do is we okay we say that okay let's take an artificial completely ad hoc, uh, I mean, co sorry, completely artificial uh, sphere of um, coordinate distance L in the eta metric. So just, just it, it is completely uh, right now, uh, you know, it's an intermediate choice, which will not play any role later, but as you'll see, it simplifies things for us. So I take in the eta metric, some sphere of uh, uh, radius L. And uh, then uh, the what I, what I assume is that outside this, so outside, L, only we only have long range forces. Long range forces. For example, okay, if these particles are just neutral, then only say gravity, for example. So all the hard stuff is happening in the region, you know. Um, uh, uh, so, so everything is happening, or everything that we do not know about is happening at mod x less than L. So we don't know anything about mod x than L, no idea. We really have no clue about it. And as you will see that we won't need any 
uh, details about the scattering as far as as long as we are interested in the soft expansion of the of the metric. So this is the setup. So now, but now we have to say, okay, if there are only long range forces uh, outside the sphere of radius L, then can I say something about the um, the trajectories of the particle at mod x greater than L? Like I, I obviously cannot say anything for mod x less than L, and then we can use. Uh, 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 you know, so we can say that okay. To so begin with, so at zeroth order, uh, so, so sorry, first because there they can be composite objects. Let me just write T A B X. So X is of a mod X uh, greater than L. So let me just write it as you know, it could be uh, if you, if you have some particle like you know some yeah okay it's just going to be P sigma sigma. Uh, plus, uh, we will have um, if, if you know if you have the spin, if the object has a spin angular momentum, then we will have sigma um, uh, a yeah, sorry, I think it will be p p a uh, p a sigma sigma b c sigma partials delta plus other terms and and it turns out that of course uh, for curved black hole just in uh, computed all these terms exactly thanks to no health theorem but it turns out that if you are interested in h minus 1 ab and h0 ab then we only need these two terms. We don't need uh, we don't need uh, to know about any other terms. So so this is enough uh, for us to uh, compute the first two terms. And um, now suppose we say that for mod x greater than l, we parameterize our trajectory as let's say that you know uh, R A of sigma as some C A. C A is the you know uh, I, I will explain what C A is in a minute. Plus the asymptotic momenta, let's say P A. Um, um, let's say plus sigma, say in, in, uh, asymptotically, plus some deviation vector delta r is Now you can quickly check that, sorry, because I don't have time, I just quickly summarize that. You can quickly check that uh, this error, the, the delta r, the deviation from the free trajectory goes as one over L to the d minus force. If you only have long range forces. So that implies that, you know, uh, in the L going to infinity limit, and if d is greater than four, uh, we can they, they, these terms are suppressed, but not for d equal to four. And that's where the subtlety comes, which uh, I think I will not have time to get. Into. So this is the place where uh, 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 where the four-dimensional subtlety comes into picture. So okay, so if we uh, uh, so let us say that we are in to begin with, let us say we are in d greater than four. So then we can assume that for mod x greater than l, our all the our objects are free. Uh, so sorry, sigma. Where the CA is just the you know position the object will take at this uh, at the L. So if this is the particle uh, that I'm following, and its trajectory uh, R A sigma is going to so I, I start here at sigma equal to zero, and then I go up, and this trajectory is C A plus P A. And I'm assuming it's a free particle, uh, uh, and just just for a moment when d is greater than four. So I use this, and the only other thing I have to use is the fact that stress energy tensor, the total stress energy tensor, is locally conserved uh, with respect to the eta metric, which is what nicely Weinberg shows also in his uh, uh, book. So if I use this equation and I use this trajectory, then I can first compute. Um, you know, so I can compute E alpha beta in the out region in mod x greater than L region, which is going to be equal to uh, integral uh, dB x prime uh, greater than L uh, E alpha beta x prime e to the i k dot x prime. But this is easy to now compute because this is now free stress tensor.
and then there is a contribution from the in region sorry i am going a bit fast just because of lack of time so there is a contribution from the in region and which i actually have no idea about at all but it turns out that because the stress sensor is locally conserved we can use the fact that t alpha uh, do alpha t alpha beta is zero and uh, and use this to evaluate this up to order omega to the zero in d greater than four dimensions and so if i use this i, I just sorry i was very brief with this but i now add these two contributions and then you can immediately show that e tilde alpha beta as a function of omega and xa is given by so i'm going to first write the contribution from this massive objects because i have not so far taken into account the radiation field and that contribution is precisely given by summation over i um, so I, I, I is the uh, yeah uh, all uh, uh, yeah so let me so let me say it my the i some more all particles so i i will have minus 1 to the sigma i depending on their incoming or outgoing then i have my pi alpha pi beta divided by pi dot k plus um, summation over i um pi alpha i i explain now that just one new notation i am introducing here pi beta gamma to gamma divided by pi dot k where j is the total angular momentum for the ice particle so it is given by the orbital part which in this case is just the you know the impact parameter plus the spin if it had a, if it has a spin component uh and this result just want to emphasize that this result is uh exact in degree to four so we didn't we didn't make any uh assumptions any any extra assumptions and if we have finite energy radiation then the contribution from the finite energy radiation so i will just write for this one because of lack of time and i finished there so if you have finite energy radiation then you get a contribution here which uh, we can we compute in our paper and you can show that it is given by So that's the contribution that, uh, of course, people, uh, you, every most of you would know that this is the memory null memory contribution. But TUU is the stress tensor, uh, which leak out at null infinity. For example, if you only have gravity, then this will just be one fourth, um, you know, NAB. Um, and uh, just I just now conclude here. I apologize. I'm going out of over time. That. If we just take this equation now, which which uh, which we have, which the first equation, the first term in the soft expansion, so let, let me collect all this stuff and let me just call it the soft, soft factor. I just call it S zero, which depends on the momenta, asymptotic momenta, and the direction of the where we are putting our detector. Um, um so if we if we if we uh, take this equation then we can immediately show that this is equivalent to the conservation law that uh, gabriel and sasha asked about and this uh, uh, uh just one final comment that uh, if we are in d equal to 4 where the you know that deviation from the asymptotic trajectory is not zero because of the coulombic forces uh, this result does not change uh, the, the 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 reason i just end with this uh, one small statement now 
And the reason is very, very simple because of the fact that if you are looking at the leading order radiation, so we have some scattering. Um, and we are only looking at the leading order soft radiation. So that is, we are looking at the infinite wavelength uh, 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 limit of the radiation. So from that perspective, that all the interactions basically become point-like. And so effectively, this becomes uh, like, you know, just a contact interaction with particles just scattering and moving freely. And so that is why this result uh, is dimension independent and uh, universal. Now, what is uh, surprise? What, yeah, I, I really will end with one more line. I, I really sorry the, that you know, even though I had no time to talk about this, and I think Ashok will talk about this in his talk uh, next week. That you know, this uh, what what is remarkable is that the um, these terms are truly universal. That is their exact exact result, exactly like H A B minus one. So this is another exact result in four dimension. Uh, and uh, this result, even though its status is not entirely clear in four dimension, it's an exact result in um, higher dimension. But one hopes that you know, one may be able to say more about it even in four dimensions. Uh, um, yeah, and maybe I, I, I'll end here. I, I'm, I'm sorry for going over time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lork. Uh, well, let's we all thank thank you for a very thank nice you. talk. Uh, uh, we now have uh, time for questions. So please uh, raise your hand or, uh, or unmute yourself. Um, some, okay, I don't see any raised hands. Okay, there is one. And uh, so Bruno, please. Um, yes, hi, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, I can hear you. So um, my question is, uh, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, an infinite uh, wavelength uh, limit. Um, yes. How does that match with uh, sort of the observability of, uh, of these photons or gravitons? Yeah, so this is uh, 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 this, this uh, yeah, since I did not have time, I mean, this really is, as you, as you are saying, it's a zero frequency effect. So it's like, a, you know, it's a DC, DC component in the signal. And this is what is known as the memory memory effect. So this really, this, this, this statement, um, so let me go back. Um, yeah, this statement. Um, this, this really is a statement of the, what is called the linear memory effect, if, uh, where we only have massive particles which are contributing to radiation. And if we added this extra term, this one, then we get the, um, we get the, uh, the full memory uh, term. So the idea that the infinite wavelength, this, there is an infinite wavelength uh, perturbation in the metric once you have some, you know, some scattering that happened and some radiation leaked out, that, that it's exactly the memory. So, so it, is a, it is the observable. Like, I, I, I hope I answer your question. Well, yes, sort of. But um, so would you say that uh, uh, we don't need to introduce uh, uh, sort of an IR cutoff? To uh, yeah, yeah. In this in this computation, we don't. Uh, yeah, we don't need any IR cutoff uh, uh, because it's just we are just computing the you know just the zero frequency limit of a of a radiation. So some of the infrared divergences which come in, they do not you know they do not affect this uh, this result. Okay. Yeah. No, but I don't mean uh, divergences. I just mean. Uh... Uh, oh, I see. I understand what you're saying, but I thought uh, this was the memory. This was the interpretation. I think many people here know much more. I thought my understanding was that this is what classical displacement memory was. That you really look at the, uh, you know, you, what what I okay. Physically, what I mean is that you know, if if we if we look at the radiation at uh, at late times uh, on sky uh, as you goes to infinity, then the 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 result that we get, we we get can be understood as follows. So if you look at this HAB instead of in frequency space, we look at in the U space. Yeah. Then we get we get a component which is called H minus one EB XA plus a component which is which will be log XA by U plus dot dot dot. So this component is precisely the the memory. So it's the the very late time radiation component that uh, remains. And, uh, but it's a constant component, you know, it, it, it is not, um, it's not, um, 
uh, you know, it's not decaying or growing or anything like that. And this is the one which is usually called tail to the memory, which was already, uh, uh, which was already, in, I think, known in classical theory already in the paper of uh, Thibault and uh, Luke uh, in this hereditary paper. But I think now it has been rediscovered in the soft constraints on amplitude also. So, so I hope that answers your question. So it, it is, um, it is something that you have to wait long enough to. I, I mean, you know, it, it's the if you wait very long enough. And if you can isolate the mode which is constant, then that's the memory. Okay. So, in a sense, uh, uh, you have to wait forever, but. Uh, but I think that maybe not forever, but you no, know, a lo long time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, next question. Uh, I apologize if I mispronounced Decorti. No, I, actually, it's not a question, it's uh, an announcement. First of all, I want to thank again the lecturers of the school, uh, which is going to end. We have the last lectures right now. And I have an announcement concerning the conference of next week. If you are registered, you receive the Zoom uh, a link to attend the conference. But anyway, the seminars will be uh, live streaming streamed so you can find on our web page uh, all the instruction if you want to attend the conference even if you are not uh, registered that's all thank you okay thank you um so for the for the for the previous uh, discussion isn't like i agree that formally we we have to wait for infinite amount of time but let's say if we know yes. that the the physics is like the two things collide and uh, and then say form a black hole, so you expect there is a burst of radiation and then yes. nothing happens. Yes. yes, yes. So in practical, you can always, of course, why what why not in one million years there will be another burst of radiation which will undo the memory, but <laughs> in practice, what you care is actually physical effects from what happens to your detector before and after within this yes, yes, interesting I agree. part. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think after a few, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think if you look at the tail and so actually this tail kind of decays as one minus one by u at large u. So basically you have the waveform which will go like that. Yes. And so I guess if you wait, yeah, for a few cycles, I, I, I not, yeah, but that, then you can recover probably in practice, you can recover the memory with, uh, with small errors. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you.